Limited. This is FC International's October safety call. Uh, the purpose of these calls is to provide information and work to create a community of safety professionals in the signatory finishing trades. Now, Lorica, we will welcome Rich Martin, our safety professional consultant with OnPoint. Rich comes to us with 28 years of experience as a firefighter and now as a safety consultant to discuss fire safety. Thanks for being with us today, Rich. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, it is October, so it, that means it is Fire Prevention Month again. And uh, every October, we address fire safety in the workplace. It is a topic that is often paid lip service to, but in reality, uh, there's not a lot of emphasis uh, being paid to deliberate and intentional efforts specifically to prevent fires in the workplace. Fortunately, they are are rare, but when they do happen, they can be uh, devastating. So just as a reminder, we have the FCA safety line available to you. Uh, if you wanna take a screenshot of this slide and have it available to you, the phone number is there. And uh, calling that number for safety related issues will be answered by a safety professional. You can also send an email to safety helpline at finishingcontractors.org. This slide will show up again at the end of the presentation in case you decide later that uh, what was that information again, and uh, we will provide it. All right, so our focus is fire and life safety, and we are going to look at a little review. We have talked about fire and life safety in the workplace over the last, uh, what, I don't know, two, three years, I think it is. And uh, every year we try to build up on it, reinforce what we've already learned and introduce some additional points or topics that haven't been discussed yet. Just as a reminder though, the most common causes of fire in the workplace include combustible materials at work, generally improper storage or excess accumulation of combustible materials, especially in an area where um, fire can spread. Uncontrolled ignition sources. So ignition sources, of course, are you going to are going to be your heat that starts the fire. Faulty equipment is a big contributor to fires. Clutter, human error, and arson is uh, it is a thing. It's the least likely. Uh, these are listed in order of likelihood, yeah, but uh, arson is a thing. Sometimes uh, disgruntled employees will light a workplace on fire. Sometimes it's People who have bypassed security in your untended workplace gotten in and, and light, lighted fires there too. So we just want to bring that up. From a security standpoint, try and make it difficult for people to start fires in your workplace. And uh, if one does happen, it'll be have less of an impact. All right, just a quick review. Fire consists of three main components, the fuel, the stuff that burns, the oxygen in the atmosphere that feeds the fuel and the heat. If you take away any one of these, or if you have all three of these, you'll have a fire. If you take away any one of them, you'll have uh, no fire. So that's our goal. The um, heat is uh, the main topic we're gonna be talking about today. We'll be talking about spontaneous combustion. Um, what it is, the name spontaneous combustion is actually a little bit of a misnomer because it can be explained. But the heat aspect of the fire generally is open flame, sparks, heating coils, electrical arcs, and high temperatures. In the finishing trades, especially painters, there is that risk of uh, the spontaneous combustion, which we'll be looking at. All right, the four most common sources of fire ignition in the workplace, thermal. So here we're talking temperature transfer. Uh, just as when you lay out on the beach and the sun is beating down on you and uh, you're getting sunburnt or you're getting pretty warm, you move to the shade and, of course, you cool down, you have what is called radiant transfer of heat. And you can have hot items in the workplace transfer enough heat to a flammable item, causing it to uh, ignite. Electrical is a big contributor. Electrical equipment, if it is faulty, can start fires, mechanical, and then chemical reactions can also be a source of heat. 
So let's look at thermal. Here's some examples of thermal uh, sources of fire ignition in the workplace. You have direct transfer of heat, blow torches, cigarettes, lighters, embers. I'm sure you can think of any number of uh, uh, activities that go on in the workplace. Let's say welding, uh, cutting, porch cutting, grinding, sparks getting onto uh, items that are easily ignitable. Indirect heat, radiant heat. So we're coming into the winter weather. You may start seeing torpedo heaters, kerosene fired heaters in the workplace. Uh, they, uh, they can be focused for a long period of time on something that is ignitable, eventually reaching, causing it to reach temperature of flash, and then it'll ignite. Sunlight focused through a lens can be an issue. Uh, as John um, mentioned in the beginning, I spent 24 years in the fire service. And uh, one of the house fires I was on was started by sunlight being focused through a snow globe on someone's desk. So the sunlight went into the snow globe, was focused like a magnifying glass onto some papers on the desk, lit the, uh, uh, the papers on the desk on fire and lit the room on fire. So it is a thing if you do see that you have uh, beams of sunlight being collated into a fine point, it'd be a good idea to get that taken care of. You may also find workers who bring hot plates in, furnaces, heaters, stoves, burn barrels in order to keep warm. Those can also be sources of ignition that you want to maintain. Hot plates really discourage the use of those in the workplace. If they are going to be permitted for use in the workplace, then there needs to be a designated area which is kept free of any flammables, ignitable objects. When the heating implements are not in use, microwaves also, when they're not in use, they should be unplugged. And when they are plugged in, they should always be plugged into a power strip with uh, the uh, surge protection and the overload protection. Then, of course, the biggest contributor of virtually all safety uh, incidents that happen in the workplace is just human error. People are people. They make dumb mistakes or you know, usually out of carelessness, complacence, or just uh, ignorance. They don't know any better. So we do want to watch out for that as well. Never assume your workers know uh, the right way to do things. So here's your electrical sparks from uh, arcing electrical equipment, arc flash or arc blast. Exposed wires can heat up ignitable materials and start fires. You may see that in extension cords. You may see that in extension cords with exposed conductors up against something that is conductive. Static electricity can start fires. When you are transferring liquid fluids, the act of the fluid transferring through the, the hoses can generate static electricity, which can start the fumes coming off the fuels on fire. If you remember, uh, it's probably back in the 80s, there was a big thing about filling your gasoline cans in the back of your pickup truck with those plastic bed liners. And static electricity could ignite those fumes because the metal can was not grounded. So the rule came out that when you fill your fuel containers, you need to place them on the ground before you start filling your fuel containers. Overheating of electrical equipment, if something is preventing it from cooling down, let's say cooling fins on motors are clogged up with dust and debris or oil buildup, they won't cool as efficiently. The motors themselves can get hot. Same thing with service panels, transformers. If you are working in dusty environments, they can cause all those electrical components to uh, uh, achieve a coating of insulation, which prevents them from cooling down. And if that insulation is flammable, you can ignite that insulation. Think uh, metal dust in a metal factory, for example, or sawdust building up inside electrical panels that are not sealed properly. Induction heating, I have a, uh, an example here of induction heating. In this case, someone used a extension cord to power an electrical piece of equipment and they did not un uncoil the extension cord. As the electricity travels around in that coil, it builds up heat. 
And in this case, there was enough heat to melt the plastic cord rail. If it had left, if it had been left running in that condition for long enough, that plastic could have ignited and started a fire. And I was on one house fire that started exactly that way. Someone had too long of a cord behind their uh, humidifier in their room. So they coiled it up. They had it behind the humidifier plugged into the wall and the, co uh, the wire coil heated up enough to start the wood paneling on fire. So just an example of induction heating. Don't run coiled up cords, stretch them out so they can cool down. And then human error is going to be a, uh, a factor in every one of these sources of fire ignition. Mechanical friction, mechanical parts rubbing against each other can heat up if they're not properly lubricated or they're not properly cooled down, eventually getting the heat up to red hot. Uh, if you ever watch racing every now and again, they'll show somebody's brakes are glowing red hot because of the friction uh, on the uh, brake pads. And that very hot temperature can ignite uh, flammable items. Overheated equipment due to poor ventilation, worn out bearings, poor lubrication, run at too high of a speed. Mechanical equipment needs to be well ventilated. So when you're running it in an enclosed area, you walk into the room and you say, my, this room's pretty warm in here. Well, that's the, the, the electrical components and the motor itself just running and generating that heat. Chemical interactions between chemicals. This is not common in the workplace, but in the finishing trades, you guys work with chemicals more than most. Some chemicals, when they interact, they can generate heat. For example, if you mix an acid and a base together, they'll neutralize each other, but when in the neutralization process, they can generate a lot of heat, including flammable vapors that may be ignited by an ignition source nearby. Combustible materials such as flammable vapors and gases. So here we're talking about uh, gasoline containers that are not vented properly or not stored in a well-ventilated area. Thinners, paints, uh, all of these are examples of chemicals that can ignite and uh, start a fire. Battery charging as well. You see more and more in the news lately about lithium batteries firing up and uh, creating a fire. Mostly it's happening in very large batteries like battery storage units, let's say for a generator system, um, car batteries. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that with the flooding that's been going on in the Southeast, People with electric cars, the cars are being submerged in salt water. The batteries don't like the sodium that's in the in the salt water and they react. And next thing you know, you have a car fire. These lithium fires are very, very difficult to put out. They burn so hot that they actually take the hydrogen and the oxygen that's in water and they break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. So they turn water into not only a fuel, but an oxidizer that enhances the burning process. So conventional wisdom is when you are charging lithium batteries, do that outside. Just as a point of interest, I was looking at purchasing a battery assist bicycle. You know, now that I'm older, it, my mountain bike is not as comfortable. I'm leaning forward too far. My wrists fall asleep. Um, it's just not fun. So I go to the bike shop and I say, what can I do? And they say, Rich, you're not a young man anymore. You need an old man's bike. And then I argue, well, that looks dumb. I don't want to look like an old man. I say, well, Rich, it is what it is. So I'm looking at these electric bikes. The guy at the bike shop says, do not buy an electric bike from Amazon. Do not buy an, a cheap electric bike. If you're going to buy an electric bike, if you are spending less than $2,000 on one of these electric bikes, you are going to run into problems. And he also said, Make sure when you charge these batteries, you charge them until they're full and then you disconnect them or you charge them outside. Don't charge them in your garage and leave them charging until the next time you ride your bike. That might be a month from now. In the meantime, those batteries are getting warmer and warmer. Down here under chemical, you'll see the last one, decomposition, mulch piles, and properly discarded chemicals, oily rags. Here's where we're talking about what is commonly referred to as spontaneous combustion. The technical term is heat of decomposition. And what happens is, as hydrocarbon materials or organic materials break down, the 
oxidation process and the breakdown process of the hydrocarbons generates heat. And if it is not allowed to vent and maintain its uh, ambient temperature, that heat will build up. In the winter, well, no, let's not, uh, yeah, in the cooler weather, if you go past a landscaping supply center, you may see large piles of mulch steaming away out in the uh, south 40 of the, of the landscape supply center. And that's that mulch breaking down. And there have been large mulch piles that have ignited because they weren't stirred up enough or the insides of the mulch pile were not allowed to dry out. And the moisture enhanced the decomposition and started a big mulch pile, uh, mulch fire. But improperly discarded chemicals can decompose and uh, ignite in oily rags as well. So there's your oily rags. This here is a short video showing some oily rags. They just got some oily rags and stuck them in a grill next to some little twigs to start a fire. The oil in the rags is just decomposing. This is uh, three hours after placing the rags in the fire pit or in the uh, oven here. I think this is real time also, so this is not sped up for uh, your viewing pleasure, but you can see the smoke getting heavier and heavier. It's building up, and eventually, pretty darn soon, those rags are going to ignite. And if they are near anything else that's flammable, such as those twigs there, they'll ignite those as well. So this is why it is very important to make sure that when you're on the job site, those oily rags are properly laid out to dry and properly discarded. So we'll look at that. Heat of decomposition, spontaneous combustion, or fire without an ignition source. Mostly we're looking at oils, solvents, paints. Some fuels contain hydrocarbons, and as these items dry, they decompose, giving off heat. If they're in contact with a fuel, such as those twigs that are in that little oven we saw, the heat from the rags may be enough to start the combustion. Of course, the rags, if they are flammable, they can ignite as well. Oils have a lower ignition temperature or flash point, and they'll start up first. So the rags, oily rags, will heat up more quickly than the wood would or the paper would and uh, start the fuel up. The rags will sustain the combustion like a fire, I mean like a candle, until something else burns. And then the fire spreads from there. Oily rags are the most common thing you'll find on the on the work site that could be a fire risk but you may see the same thing with steel wool oil soaked waste so let's say you used cardboard to catch an oil drip and that oil drip has not been allowed to dry or ventilate properly paper materials that are oily any material where the oil or the solvent can't evaporate properly and dry out can start a fire so we are looking at oily substances or oily soaked substances where the oil is still uh, liquid, wet, damp. Once it dries out, you're okay. So depending on the solvent or the oily substance being used, the decomposition, the rate of decomposition can, can vary. You saw the stove with the rags in there and the subtitle said that the rags had been in there for approximately three hours and within 60 seconds of us watching that video, the rags ignited and then started the, the twigs that were in there on fire as well. It may take an hour to begin, may take several hours to begin. If it is not allowed to dry out, you may not have heat of decomposition ignition for even a couple of days, but uh, it can happen even a couple of days later if they aren't allowed to dry out. So the temperature outside, the humidity outside, if it's hot out, if it's uh, dry out, very little humidity, if the rags are tightly packed together, you might have a delayed response in ignition. But uh, And if they're looser packed together, they might evaporate more quickly. I'm not sure on that one, whether uh, tight rags and uh, loose rags, uh, one burns more quickly than the other. My suspicion is the tighter the rags are, the slower things will evaporate, the more they'll remain moist and liquid, and the more likely you'll have that decomposition. Different products, different oils will have a uh, 
different rate of combustion as well. Paint thinners, acetone, uh, toluene, things like that, they are what is called um, very volatile, which means that it very much wants to go from a liquid to a gas. So if you were to spill acetone on the floor, within probably a few minutes, that acetone would evaporate and you would have a dry floor, maybe a stain on the floor at best, right? So that's called very volatile. If you were to pour diesel fuel, another hydrocarbon liquid on the floor, uh, that is what you would call very um, persistent and it would not evaporate very quickly. And three days later, you'd walk in and it would still be wet or maybe you might even slip on it or you step in it and you're tracking an oily footprint across the floor. So the thinners, the thinner the, the uh, hydrocarbon liquid, the more likely it is to be volatile and evaporate. And that's what we want. We want it to evaporate and dry. Evidence of heating will typically start with visible smoke. Of course, visible smoke, usually before you even see it, you'll start to smell it. So if you're at the workplace and you think you smell something burning, look around, think about it. Generally, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? So if you see visible smoke, it may be difficult to note the source at first, but usually where it's thickest is where the source is. If we can take care of the problem before it ignites, then we're okay. But remember last year we saw the video with the Christmas tree on fire. Remember that fire can double in size every minute until it runs out of available fuel. So the quicker we can get on top of this and put out the fire and remove the flammable materials to a well-ventilated outdoors, uh, away from flammable items, the better off we are. Alcohol substances don't typically spontaneously combust because they are, they're not hydrocarbons. They don't have that carbon element in there. While alcohol is flammable, of course, we know that, it also tends to evaporate very quickly. So you don't see spontaneous combustion happening with alcohol chemicals. When we think of safety, as in everything, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. When we think of safety, most people, the first thing they think of is PPE, right? Why do we wear a hard hat? Because something might fall on our head. Why do we wear protective footwear with protective toes? Well, the shaft on the boot helps support our ankle, so we're less likely to twist or turn our ankle. The protective toe keeps us from smashing our toes if we drop a heavy object on it, let's say a tool or a box of materials. The gloves protect our hands from abrasions and cuts. The safety glasses protect us from, of course, flying particulate matter in the uh, air, as well as chemical splash. And then uh, generally the other, you know, the top five you'll see include the high visibility vests or clothing so that people operating equipment can see you and uh, react in time to avoid hitting you. But if we can eliminate the hazard of something falling on you, then we don't need hard hats. If we can eliminate the hazard of something flying through the air, then we don't need safety glasses. The idea with protecting your workers against safety hazards is number one, to eliminate the hazard. Often that's not possible. Well, if it's not possible to eliminate the hazard, we have to work with or around this hazard. Well, then we can substitute the hazard. You guys, I'm sure, have seen the yellow safety clean trucks that are on the road. These are places, uh, companies that come out and they do industrial cleaning. They'll do uh, all kinds of cleaning work. Way in the beginning, before safety clean, most of the chemicals that were used could be hazardous, some of them even toxic, flammable, um, corrosive. Safety Clean came along and said, is there a way that we can come up with products that are safe to use, biodegradable, don't harm the environment, won't expose workers to hazards, inhalation hazards, eye hazards, skin hazards? And they hired a bunch of chemists and chemical engineers to come up with cleaning products that would eliminate or at least substantially reduce the hazardous components of these products. And they were able to do that. And as a result, now a lot of chemicals that you use in the workplace or in your household that used to be um, you know, much more hazardous are, are much safer to use. So we, that's what we look at as an example of substitution. Engineering controls are permanent things we put in place 
that protect workers from the hazard. A guardrail around a fall hazard is an example of an engineering control. The fall hazard still exists, but by installing the guardrails, now we don't need to do tie-off anymore. So we don't need that PPE with the tie-off. Here's an example of an engineering control for uh, the oily rigs. What you see here is a fire-resistive uh, flammable rags or flammable oily waste can. It self-closes, right? You step on that lever down there near the bottom, and uh, and the lid opens up. You drop in your oily rags. You step off the, 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 uh, the latch there, and the lid closes. What that does is it smothers any fire that starts inside that can. Because the can is metal, if fire does start inside the can or the oily rags get hot enough to start a fire, the can being fire resistive at least won't melt and contribute to the fire. Note the capacity is small. These things are generally only about five gallons or so. That's so that you don't put too much in there. Note that the bottom is ventilated. That's so that if there are oily rags at the bottom of the can, they're not starting the floor on fire underneath the can because it got too hot. And then you'll see right there on the front, empty every night. What that means is you take it out of the structure and you bring it outside and uh, away from areas where there might be flammable materials. Don't throw your oily rags at the end of the day into the dumpster outside where all the flammable materials are. I can tell you from much experience, dumpster fires are very difficult to fire, uh, fight. And if they are close to a building, very often they'll light the building on fire or at least do significant heat damage to the building. Administrative controls, those are policies and procedures, the way we do things, your training. We train people to put oily rags in an uh, oily waste container. At the end of the day, they are trained to take them outside. Uh, or uh, what would be best is they get taken out to a uh, well-ventilated area and laid out on a non-flammable material, laid, them, laid out flat so that the oil uh, is allowed to evaporate. An alternative, too, is to keep these things in water. So if you had a 55-gallon drum outside full of water, and at the end of the day, you took your oily rags and you soaked them, you, you, you just doused them in that water, dunked them in that water, uh, that, too, would prevent a fire. What it will not do is prevent the oil from evaporating. So the best method would be to lay them out flat until they're hard and dry, and then you can throw them away like normal trash. And now we're down to personal protective equipment. So here's what is known as the hierarchy of controls. The Center for Disease Control uses this. OSHA uses this. Uh, pretty much every federal agency and every safety organization knows this. If you are intimately involved with safety, this is uh, elementary to you. But if you are uh, just interested in knowing how to protect your workers better, this is the way you would use it, uh, the, way, the process you would use. OSHA looks at personal protective equipment as a measure of last resort, not a measure of first resort. Before you allow your workers to use personal protective equipment, you should make every effort to do one of the four, you know, all of the four steps up above and only use personal protective equipment when all of the four steps above were ineffective. So prevention, just as a review, we want to reduce ignition and fuel and oxygen sources. That eliminates the risk of a fire. By reducing ignition source, we can reduce ignition sources by conducting routine inspections and regular maintenance of tools and equipment. Often inspections are done as we think of it. Inspections really need to be done deliberately, periodically, and frequently. So for example, in the fire service, we like the first Monday of the month. The weekend is done. We want to start the week off at the first uh, on the right foot. So the first Monday of the month is, for example, the day that we would inspect our fire extinguishers. When we're inspecting fire extinguishers, remember number one, we want to make sure they are where they're supposed to be. Number two, that they're in good condition, ready to use. And number three, that they're not damaged. The gauge isn't uh, you know, too low. It's still in the green. Um, they're not being used for door stops and, uh, and uh, other purposes. We want to make sure that all of our tools and equipment are in good condition. 
If you're checking a piece of running equipment and you smell, hmm, that thing smells hot or it smells like it's burning up, maybe it's time to take that thing out of service and have someone take a look at it. But inspections should be done minimum weekly. If you have a dedicated safety person, that safety person should be inspecting the job site every single day. Sometimes an inspection before lunch and an inspection after lunch because conditions are often dramatically different within the space of just a couple hours. If you're using flammable materials, try to use non-sparking tools, especially striking tools or electrical tools. Control any open flame. Take a look at the hot work permit process. FCA safety manual has a, uh, a hot work program. Hot work program basically says before you do any hot work, Hot work is any process that generates an ignition source such as flame or sparks. Uh, before you do any hot work, you eliminate any flammable materials in the area. If there are any in the area that you cannot eliminate, then you protect them by perhaps wetting them down, spraying them down with water so that if a spark lands, it's gonna be immediately extinguished. Maybe you'll cover it with fire resistant blankets, but you're going to do whatever you can to separate the ignition source from the fuel. Make sure you control static electricity, use proper grounding of electric equipment. In the absence of grounding, you must use uh, ground fault circuit interrupt outlets. So whenever you're plugging into a uh, electrical supply within a building, for example, you should have a GFCI tester, plug that in first, test to see if it's GFCI protected. If it isn't, Make sure you plug in a GFCI pigtail, usually about two feet long or so. You plug it into the outlet. There's the GFCI test and reset switch. And then there might be one, two, three outlets coming off of that. But every extension cord and every tool you operate in the workplace, including those low, low draw uh, radios, battery chargers, things like that, need to be plugged into a GFCI. Make sure you insulate and guard hot surfaces. We don't want flammable materials falling onto a hot plate that somebody left on by mistake. Reduce your fuel sources, store fuel sources such as flammable liquids and gases in approved containers. So that means that with your flammable painting materials, your solvents, your thinners, we only want to bring into the building what we need for that day. We don't want to bring in a pallet full and store it inside a building or a room that is not ventilated. They must be stored in the approved containers. Generally, that would be the container that it came in or maybe a portable container of the same type. That's why we come down pretty hard on plastic gasoline cans at the workplaces because they are not fire resistive. And if there is a fire and the plastic melts, now that plastic releases that gasoline into the fire. Store flammable gas cylinders outside or in a well-ventilated area. Limit the quantity on hand as much as possible. Only bring in what you need. Keep flammable materials away from ignition sources and watch those ignition sources. Earlier, I mentioned that with the colder weather, you're gonna start seeing room heaters, space heaters, torpedo heaters. Uh, those things tend to move around. Wherever the workers are, they want that heat, heat nearby and they bring the heater over and maybe they're not paying too much attention to any flammable materials nearby. Control dust accumulation. Dust accumulation is an indicator of poor general housekeeping, but it is also potentially flammable. Even flammable metals, aluminum, uh, even steel can uh, burn under the right circumstances. But sawdust, uh, any flammable, uh, dusty products, we want to keep those away from ignition sources as well. Reduce your oxygen sources as much as possible. <laughs> How are you going to do that? Well, I guess the best way would be to have a well-ventilated area for your flammable vapors and gases. And uh, also, when you are working in flammable areas or areas in which internal combustion area uh, internal combustion engines are being run, we want to monitor the air, make sure the flammable vapors aren't getting up too high and the oxygen isn't being pushed out to uh, low levels. Oxygen cylinders need to be stored properly. They need to be uh, securely closed. The valves need to be tightly closed because an oxygen cylinder can leak oxygen into an atmosphere 
increasing the oxygen levels and making the room uh, oxygen enriched, increasing the likelihood of fire. Also, we wanna make sure oxygen cylinders are stored at least 25 feet away from flammables. Many people think that means 25 feet away from flammable cylinders, such as acetylene or propane. No, it's any flammable, including flammable trash and debris, wood, paper, burning materials, because if that stuff lights up, the radiant heat from that fire can increase the pressure inside an oxygen cylinder and cause it to vent, now introducing pure oxygen into your fire. And uh, that would certainly be exciting. I said 25 feet, I stand corrected by my own presentation here. Oxygen cylinders need to be at least 20 feet away from all flammables. They should be secured by a chain or a cable to a structural support so that they don't fall over. If they fall over, they can take damage, they can roll around, they can become a trip hazard or a struck by hazard. Make sure those protective caps are installed on the valves. And uh, let's see what else. The oily rags. Never ball up the oily rags or pile them in a tight mass while they're still wet. Best to just lay them out and let them dry. Spread them outdoors on the ground or on a metal rack until completely dry and hard. Some people will have a uh, like an aluminum ladder laying on its side. They may lay them out on the beam of the aluminum ladder just to allow them to bake in the sun until they're dry. Days is usually enough, but confirm they're dry before putting them in the trash. If the rags catch fire outdoors, douse them with water or cover with sand or dirt. A good practice, by the way, is to have a good source or a good means of extinguishing a fire near your trash receptacles, near your dumpsters, so that if you do have careless disposal of flammable materials or smoldering, smoldering materials, you have a means to hand right away where you can uh, at least get started putting out that fire while emergency response is responding. Um, many people don't know this either, but where you're storing large quantities of flammable gas outside, let's say a big propane cylinder for heat use, uh, within the unheated building or uh, a uh, drop tank for diesel fuel. A fire extinguisher needs to be no further away than 50 feet and no closer than 25 feet to that fuel uh, storage area. So that if there is a fire that might affect those flammable items, you can put the fire out before those flammable items uh, become involved. If rags catch fire indoors, call fire department and evacuate the building. Only after the building is evacu evacuated should you attempt to extinguish with a fire extinguisher. Sometimes cowboys will go in and they'll try and put that fire out right away, not realizing that the fire is too big for their fire extinguisher or the fuel is too flammable. And if we had gotten people out earlier, they might be able to make a safe evacuation. But sometimes that fire builds up so quickly that now people cannot get safely out the building. And now they're jumping out of windows or trying to run through the flames. Don't use a fire extinguisher unless you've been trained. I have to throw that in there because them's the rules. Um, the building code requires the placement of fire extinguishers in buildings. But OSHA requires employees to not use fire extinguishers unless they have been trained to use that fire extinguisher. That includes annual training on how to select fire extinguishers, how to use them, how to how fires uh, work and how to put them out. And it also requires a hands-on component where you are actually using the fire extinguisher to uh, put out real fires in training. So what happens is employers don't train because well, that costs money, it takes time, uh, but the fire extinguishers are there and everybody gives a nod and a wink to, if you think you know how to use a fire extinguisher, we're not gonna stop you from doing it. So that often is the mentality in the construction setting. Do keep in mind though, that you cannot run around and tell your employees to use the fire extinguisher to put out fires without first training them. If they do get hurt or something happens, and then uh, the guy says, well, I was never trained to use a fire extinguisher. He told me to use it. There's some liability there. All right, some reminders on fire prevention. General housekeeping is huge. I've been in some sites where general housekeeping is just, it, we'll do it on Friday if we can get to it. 
and there's time permitting. Uh, I have some photos. I think I showed them to you guys before, but piles of debris, three, four, five feet high in the middle of a room being worked on. And we are talking about a room that is in the finishing stages. A lot of the debris is drywall and, and uh, finishing materials. Control accumulation, store those flammables safely, keep them away from those ignition sources, bring in only as much as you need. So we're kind of repeating what we've talked about before just to reinforce. But generally, housekeeping should be done uh, every day as the work progresses. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, take it out. Those gondolas should be there. Roll them out when they're when they're full. Dump them in your designated trash disposal area. Bring them back in. Uh, a lot of times you need a designated laborer in order to be able to do that. General contractor should be providing that. But if you maintain your waste accumulation as you make it, it won't be a big job later. Ventilation, anytime you're, you guys are painters, you guys, um, but those of you who are painters, you know, ventilation is key. Uh, the fumes can affect people medically and physically. And of course, any fumes that are in there may contribute to a fire. So keep the area well ventilated. Review the emergency evacuation plan and practice it. I bring this up to every inspection that I go on. Uh, and I ask them, you know, I'll ask three different people, what's your emergency evacuation plan? And I'll get three different answers. When I ask them where their muster location is, in other words, after you evacuate the building, where are you all supposed to meet up? I will get two different answers and another, I don't know. You know, we'll meet by the truck. Why? Because emergency evacuation plans are never talked about and never, never practiced. It's very rare that this is done. So an emergency evacuation plan could be something as simple as just a diagram of the building pointing where the entrances are, an established assembly point. If you look on the left there, you'll see five steps. Who do you report the emergency to? Evacuate to emergency exits immediately. And look, here's some big red arrow showing you where they are. A little reminder, don't use the elevators. Follow your evacuation procedures and then proceed to your assembly point. This is a simple emergency evacuation plan that each subcontractor should have in addition to whatever it is the general contractor puts together, if the general contractor puts out something together at all. But the biggest reason people get injured in emergencies, and we're talking fire evacuation, medical, earthquake, uh, hurricane slash tornado, floods, man-made disasters, uh, the biggest reason people get hurt is they did not have a mindset that something could happen. And because they did not acknowledge the fact that something could happen, they never made a plan for what if it does happen. So when we see emergency evacuation plan, that means something that's established. Make sure you have one established with your crew and that every Monday, perhaps, you review the emergency evacuation plan or at the very least, whenever the workplace changes. You're now on the second floor. Is the emergency evacuation plan the same as it was on the first or the third floor? It might be different. The floor layout might be different. The exits might be different. So those should be reviewed. First, uh, The first day of every week, seven o'clock in the morning, six, whenever you start your shift, the foreman should be pulling the crew together and just having a safety talk. You're looking at the guys. Are they all here? Yep. Um, do they all look like they're healthy and rested? Somebody limping around or looking like they're having back pain that they're going to report two, three hours into the job. Uh, but also, here's an opportunity to do your weekly toolbox talk, review your emergency evacuation plan, and maybe do uh, uh, a, a job-specific or a tool-specific review of a tool, how to use a tool, how not to, not to use a tool. But that's a great opportunity. It starts the week out on the right foot. And then for the rest of the week, you reinforce whatever safety topic you talked about on that Monday morning safety talk. Inspect those fire extinguishers monthly. OSHA's, lang or, I'm sorry, NFPA's language, which OSHA incorporates, says that fire extinguishers need to, inspected, need to be inspected at intervals not to exceed 30 days. Many employers think the annual inspection where they put a tag on your fire extinguisher is enough. That's not what OSHA says and NFPA says. 
smoke only in designated areas. The, the wisdom in the past used to be post signs where smoking is prohibited. But it makes sense, you know, especially in areas where maybe flammables are being stored, gasoline cans, uh, the uh, compressed gas cylinders. But it's a lot easier to designate a smoking area and say smoking is permitted over here and nowhere else. And just review that with your guys, uh, with your people. Hot work, we talked briefly about hot work and uh, how to protect yourself from that. The FCA safety manual has a section in there you can review and find out just what's in there and what the responsibilities are. Watch out for those temporary heaters. Even the electric ones can start a fire. No open fires. If you're going to have a burn barrel for outdoor use, double check with your municipality. They may prohibit those. Usually they'll just give a nod and a wink. But if you're going to have a burn barrel, make sure that we're only burning flammable, you know, fireplace type materials. In other words, wasted pallets and wasted lumber and not treated lumber, you know, raw lumber. Uh, we're not throwing plastics in there and, and chemicals. We're just, the reason we're doing this is to keep warm and, you know, we're just going to use wood for that. Try to discourage the cooking as much as possible. Microwaves, I guess, are the safest. However, I was on at least one house fire that was started by, uh, in this case, a elderly woman had unwrapped her chicken she had saved, her leftover chicken. She had wrapped it up in aluminum foil. She removed the aluminum foil, but unbeknownst to her, a about a dime-sized piece of aluminum foil was still stuck to that chicken. She stuck it in the microwave, cooked it up, went into the other room, and just that little piece of foil about the size of a dime was enough to start the microwave on fire, the cabinets above the microwave, and eventually the kitchen. Let's see, temporary lighting. Temporary lighting gets abused sometimes. Uh, the cords can be damaged. They can be pulled on. They can get caught on sharp corners. I often see temporary extension cords run through the gaps in steel studs without people thinking about the sharp edges of the steel studs cutting into the sheathing on the extension cord. Uh, but we don't want an electric shock hazard and we don't want uh, the fire risk there. Dispose of those contaminated rags properly, like in that can there. All right, I said in the beginning that we will show this slide again. Uh, so if you want to uh, grab a screenshot of it or uh, write down those numbers if you need need them for future use, they are available. I just want to also remind everybody that uh, if there's any toolbox talks or anything out there that you're not seeing in our library, but you would like to see, um, don't hesitate to reach out regarding that. We'd be happy to uh, uh, try to put something together. Um, we did just have uh, we did just have one um, the other day that was created new. It was uh, solid waste disposal uh, that came up from a contractor and we're able to uh, put that together for them. Um, so if there's anything out there, also a reminder that uh, FCA safety manual includes the uh, an emergency evacuation program as well as a fire prevention program. Rich, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation today. Your uh, experience and knowledge is always a benefit to us and we very much appreciate you sharing that with us. So thank you so much for, uh, for the presentation today. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Um, thank you for your patience and uh, grace and <laughs> in, in uh, sticking with it. And I hope it's useful. The numbers are there. The emails are there. And I am here. So if you have any questions or need more information, don't hesitate to ask. Perfect. Thank you so much. Everybody have a fantastic rest of the month. Take care.